Good morning, saints of our Lord, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. We open up our Bibles this morning for the next hour in the in the inspired and true Word of God and the Word made flesh, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our light and our salvation. The light shines on us today from the last chapter of Galatians, Galatians chapter 6. One of the hard things for me is that although we went slowly through Galatians, I am going to be very sad to get through it because there's so many gems to dig in. And as we begin with Dr. Andrew Doss, who wrote the commentary on Galatians, he said, it is the unveiling of grace in our lives, beginning in Christ and also extending to our daily vocations. That is one of the struggles, but chapter 6 brings us so many more gems. Speaks about uh, being a new creation in Christ, bearing one another burdens, do good to everyone, and whatever one sows, they will also reap. A lot of grace, a lot of mercy, and a lot of Jesus. Thanks for tuning us in this morning on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thy Strong Word is graciously underwritten. Uh, we give thanks to our brothers and sisters in Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Visit lhfmissions.org for more information, lhfmissions.org. To help us be strengthened by God's Word this morning, we have with us Pastor Jeremy Klostermeyer of St. John Lutheran Church in Warrington, Missouri. Pastor Klostermeyer, welcome to Thy Strong Word. Good morning. Well, Pastor Klostermeyer, I, I thought... I should start a new game on um, Thy Strong Word. It's not really a game, but it reminds me of a game of the Six Degrees uh, uh, of Kevin Bacon. Did you ever play that game? You ever try that? I, I, uh, I have, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, right, right. And But it won't be <laughs> Kevin Bacon, not talking about Bacon here, um, but speaking about people's connections to Minnesota. Uh, uh, because the last five or six guests I've had, I, they've had a connection there, whether it was their wife's family. Uh, we have Pastor mm-hmm. Ross Shaver and his wife's family's from Minnesota around the Mankato area. And we have Pastor Ross Engel and, and his family's in way southern Minnesota. Right, basically, you take one step, you're in Iowa. And tons of people have all these Minnesota connections. And obviously, I have pride in Minnesota. So tell us about your six degrees of connection to Minnesota. What do you have? Well, it's actually just one degree because uh, I grew <laughs> up in Minnesota Hey-o. in a little town in, uh, um, well, our claim to fame, Carver County, um, uh, a few years ago at least. They were the uh, county in the whole United States that had the most Missouri Synod Lutherans per capita of any county in the whole United States, probably the whole world. So um, nice. I grew up in Norwood, Minnesota. Uh, I uh, uh, on a farm there. So on this very, very cold day, it brought back all sorts of memories as my fingers were freezing as I was tra- trying to shovel snow to dig out my car here in Warrington. <laughs> but, uh, um, or as, as uh, Minnesotans call it, Tuesday. Tuesday. Uh, so. That's right. <laughs> Every day is a winter day uh, up there. So, but uh, I love it. Yeah. So that's where I grew up in Norwood. I went to Mayor Lutheran High School. Shout out to all my fellow Crusaders. And yes. uh, from there, I went to uh, Mequon, Wisconsin, to Concordia. From there, I was a teacher for three years down in in Springfield, oh. Illinois, and from. Uh, teaching at Lutheran High in Springfield. I went to the seminary, and now I've been here in Warrington, Missouri, for going on 20 years now. Very good. I didn't know that you were a teacher first. That's wonderful, and that's one of the great blessings is when we have pastors like yourself who are teachers, because you are great guests, because you know how to teach, and I'm always learning from guys like yourself. But Warrington, Missouri, tell us about the the, the work of the saints at St. John's in Warrington. Well, it's uh, um, it's kind of <laughs> uh, like the town I grew up in. It's a uh, it, it's a little bit bigger town. We got about uh, eight nine thousand people in town here now, and it's becoming more and more of a suburb of St. Louis. It's right smack dab between St. Louis and Columbia, Missouri, on I seventy. So if you ever going east to west or west to east through the United States, you've probably gone through Warrington. But uh, um, St. John's is on its 100th year. This is our 100th anniversary year this year, and so we're uh, trying to do a few exciting things. We we're going to have a little bit bigger celebration this this coming weekend. 
Um, but COVID kind of put, and, and snow and cold all kind of put that on hold until summertime at least. Uh, we're also in the middle of a building program, and we're about to uh, start digging as soon as we can get rid of some of the snow and uh, get above freezing. So um, we're building a new fellowship hall, a bigger one, and uh, a bigger entryway narthex and those kinds of things. So we're kind of a growing community and a growing community of believers here in Warrington. So that's what's going on around these parts. Well, thanks be to God for that. Uh, one of the things that we want to do right now, and speaking about shoveling snow, even people in Missouri are doing it. Even people in Texas are doing it right now, um, which is good for our prayers, because although if you're born in Minnesota and you are live there currently, you kind of mock people that are like, it gets down to five and they freak out. But the reality is they're not set up for that. And so keep no. our no. brothers and sisters in Texas and other places. But as you're doing things like shoveling um, snow or trying to figure out what to do, we often will do multitasking things. And so one of the cool things I've been doing lately, um, Pastor Klostermeyer, is asking our listeners, you, our listeners, what are you doing while you listen to Thy Strong Word? Send us an email, kfuo at kfuo.org, and tell us what you like doing when we're studying God's Word. We've had people tell us they're doing it, they're uh, they're they're uh, listening while they exercise. I know that's something you probably do, Pastor. You you're big into yeah. exercise right now. Yeah, probably mm-hmm. listen to podcasts, doing dishes. That's one of my favorite ones. Am, uh, listen during Amazon Echo, and the newest one. Get this one. As a person who listens while working in the accounting office at their Harley Davidson dealership, and he oh, wow. says while he's doing the books, he's hearing the word of God, and in the background are all the motorcycles revving and rumbling in the other room. Um, <laughs> I think we know that Harley is quite loud, so it's kind of cool to yeah. envision, you know, as we are going through, you're a new creation in Christ, and all of a sudden you hear brum, brum, in the background, so... Anyways, I want our, our listeners, what are you doing while you're listening to thy strong word as we hear the word of God? So no, one, no one's brought up anything about the St. Louis Cardinals or uh, anything else in Missouri. So if you're in Missouri right now, what do you like to do as you hear the word of God on thy strong word? So, Pastor, let's let's dig into the word of God. That's why we're here. Um, can yeah. you ask our Lord's blessings this morning and begin us in prayer, please? Certainly. Let's pray. Lord God, as we uh, talk about uh, staying warm, we ask that you would bless those in the South who are dealing with this extreme cold and don't have the insulation or the the uh, pipes insulated and those kinds of things and are even going through rolling blackouts, that you would keep them safe from harm and that you would provide their needs and that you would use their neighbors to do so. We also ask, Lord God, that you would be with all of us as we continue through this pandemic, that you would as we learned in the last chapter of Galatians, uh, that uh, you give us the fruits of the Spirit, and one of those is Mm. patience. So we ask that you would give us patience as we continue to muddle through this COVID time. But as we continue to study your Word, and as we do so today, we ask that you'd open our hearts and open our ears, that we might learn from you what you would have us to know. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. We are uh, opening our Bibles, so everyone open up your Bibles as we get to Galatians chapter 6. Now, one of the great things that Pastor Klostermeyer and I talked about before we started this program um, is the reality that it's so good to just be in God's Word. Uh, There's a lot of uh, separation, isolation, um, other types of things, and chapter 6, I think, brings not only a... uh, um, uh, the the topping on your on your ice cream or something, or not just like your cherry on top, but it like brings all of it together into one. So, uh, Pastor Klostermeyer, do you have any um, th- this chapter? There's so much here. What? How do you want to begin with our our background and thoughts on the previous chapters as we come into this to help us out this morning? What What do you have to say for that? Well, um, as you have probably been discussing, um, you know. Uh, Paul writes to the Galatians to talk to them about how to live in this world and how to be Christians uh, and how to uh, use your freedom. Uh, But, uh, you know, the beginning of chapter 5, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So how do we use our freedom? How do we live 
live as Christians in this world, not uh, gratifying all of our sinful nature, but still uh, expressing and living in that freedom. And I think uh, chapter 6 is going to give us a a good way to do that, and and, well, lots of good ways, especially how we should uh, uh, care for and deal with uh, one another, how we should love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Absolutely. And and what's what's unique about Galatians is that you first might think, well, they're dealing with circumcision, and that doesn't relate to us. Like, well, you know, you, and it even says today, it's either circumcision or, or uncircumcision, you know, it's about being a new creation. So we might think, well, you know, that doesn't really apply to us, but really it comes to this, whenever we have Jesus plus something or something and then Jesus in the sense of uh, what we need to do, then we lose the gospel. Then we lose who we are in Christ. Um, It's all about the full sufficiency of the cross and the empty tomb for you. And and that's been a common theme that you, you wrapped it up so well, is that what he set us free... And in that freedom, how were you to do it? To gratify the desires of the flesh? No. How are we supposed to live? And that's what Paul brings together so well. It relates to us because we all want to add things to Jesus. As one one of our guests said, don't go back. Don't go back to slavery. Live in freedom and move forward by grace. So let's dig in. Verse 1. We're going to go very slowly today. Like I said, open up your Bibles. We're using the English Standard Version. And we're going to go very slowly, especially at the beginning, because there's so many gems. Verse 1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. So he speaks here of, um, I guess you say, restoring the brother, but also watching yourself. What is what is Paul telling us, or telling them, and telling us here in this verse? Well, I kind of I got to first give a, a bit of a shout out to ongoing ambassador or not to ongoing ambassadors of reconciliation. I almost said OAFC, but yeah, uh, right. ambassadors of reconciliation is a good a lot of good teachings on this first verse here, but. Uh, what I've learned from them and from my study in this is that uh, that word caught at the beginning, where it says if anyone is caught in any transgression, usually when we think of that word as we say, aha, I caught you, or you get caught you know, when you're a kid and your parents catch you doing something wrong. Uh, but that's not uh, necessarily what that word means. It's more like uh, for us Minnesotans who love to fish, especially ice fishing, it's, uh, it's more about being caught in a net Um, and you think of a fish being caught in a net you're not just gonna you know rip it out of the net or even getting a hook caught in a fish's mouth you're not just gonna rip that hook out you're gonna take it out gently so that you don't damage or destroy the fish and so that's kind of uh, the uh, the sense that is given here so if you're caught in any transgression, so if you're caught up in sin, if you're entangled in sin, or if somebody is entangled in sin, uh, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. And so uh, when you take the hook out of a fish, or when you take the fish out of a net, you're going to be very careful about how you do it, and you're going to do it in in a gentle way so that you can restore your brother, you can restore your sister because you're you're doing it because you care for that person, not because you want to prove their wrongness or you want to destroy them or you want to show them their that they are bad or that they're wrong. You're doing it so that they can be restored. Um, and so, the part of that and part of that restoring is first knowing yourself and so that's why at the end of verse one it says keep watch on yourself is you to be tempted so you got to you know think about well what is my role in this and how can i uh, be um careful about it and how can i be a servant and and care for this person and what's my attitude going to be toward that person as well so so much good stuff in that verse i could talk more more and more about it, but uh, um, it's about thinking and caring about the other person more than yourself. 
That is really profound um, because you think about the fishing analogy is, first of all, that if someone is caught in a net or not, excuse me, a fish is caught in a net, there's no way for them to get out. You know, there's no, it requires some something from the outside getting them out of that net, which obviously points us to Christ, points us yeah. to God, out coming from outside ourselves, grabbing us and pulling us back to him. But also he uses people um, in our lives that have uh, taken us out of that net. And not only that they take you out, because like you use that so well, is, you know, you can grab that fish and just take it out. Like if it's a, like in Minnesota, if it's an eel pout. You know, you just want to grab it and you want to just hit it across the boat because who wants to eat an eel pout? Nobody, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. And that's kind of what we think we want to do with people is take them out and just kind of beat them, beat them over the head even more mm -hmm. when they were caught, you know. Um, but here you're saying it so well that you take out that fish, especially if it's a walleye that you really want to eat. You take it out. You tenderly keep it because you want to keep that thing alive. Now, the end analogy here is you're going to eat it. That's not what we're talking about in, in this sense. But well, you care you know, for it. If you're a trophy it, you know? fisherman, you might want to put yeah, it back true. in the water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true too. Yeah, it's true too. So if you're thinking in that realm that you're 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 carefully handling it, you're 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 caring for it, and you will release it back. You know, usually I just want to eat them, so that's kind of how I fish. Yeah. But mm -hmm. um, but you but you think about it, that's how we get caught in in sin. It isn't we act as if you are just doing it because you don't care and you only think about yourself. Um, mm -hmm. But there is needing to be gentleness, which is a fruit of the spirit, as you said, that this is a great, oh boy, we could spend all this hour on this one verse. Okay. Um, but then he transfers to, to talk about watch yourself. It reminds me of Acts chapter 20 when it says, pay careful attention to yourselves and yeah. to all the flock. Um, reminding us that we indeed are sinful too. So when we address a brother or sister, we are not coming to them as sinless people. Thoughts on that? I mean, you talk about Ambassadors Reconciliation, which is a great organization talking about reconciliation. There's a lot to talk about, and they do a lot of great work. Other thoughts on um, keeping watch on yourself? Well, um, you know, one of the sins that uh, is prevalent in our society in our world today, even especially with Christians, is uh, talking and speaking uh, and acting out in anger. You know, in the scriptures it tells us, in your anger do not sin. And I think that's a troublesome thing. And when the world sees Christians acting out in sinful ways in anger, it causes, uh, you know, a bad witness for us. And so um, if I think of the person who is caught up, uh, who is entangled in anger and bitterness and those kinds of things, and and then you get involved with them, and then all of a sudden you're caught up in anger and bitterness and stuff like that, too, that kind yeah. of puts it all together, too. So you want to be careful, and, and um, yeah, like I said, I could spend another hour on it, but but uh, wow. triangulation and, and becoming part of the problem and instead of becoming part of the the solution and the reconciliation. And, and that's important too, as you pray today, that you also pray for the fruit of the spirit of patience. Right. Because whenever we work with other people, that we all bring a bunch of burdens to the table. And how mm -hmm. can we all, and this is like us too. I mean, we place these on the table too, when we sit with anybody, um, either over coffee or at your office or at home. Um, and so we pray, oh boy, that's, I, we're going to have to pray for patience. That's it. That's, uh, and gentleness and, and Lord have mercy. Let's move on. We're gonna, just going to do verse two because then he kind of steps it up a notch. Um, okay. Someone's caught in sin, be gentle to them. And then he, and he keeps doing this almost like adding more and more showing us the high calling we have as Christians. Verse two, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. That's that's a high calling. What is he telling us here? Well, um, you know, part of uh, I w I wouldn't call it the religion of the United States, but uh, you know, um, mind in your own business kind of thing uh, is what we hear a lot about today. Or that's their business. Let them deal with it. I'm not going to get involved with it. But uh, 
that is not so for Christians and for brothers and sisters in Christ. We are to, uh, in essence, make their life our life. So when we bear one another's burdens, it means we're taking on the burdens that they are carrying, and we do that in a uh, in a heart heart feeling, heartfelt kind of way that we actually ache and hurt for those who are burdened with sin. It's not just a, again getting back into the verse before where we are looking to care for the person. And in order to care for the person, you have to have sympathy and empathy for them. And that's, uh, and we'll see uh, that in the next verse as well, that, you know, the only way to truly care for somebody is to actually care about them. And right. the only way to care about them is to make their burdens your burdens. Right. And that's you know, one of the things, we let God's Word speak, and then we we move on from there and say, Lord, help me to do this. Because my first reaction to this when I hear it is, I that's too much for me to handle. You know, I can barely handle myself and along with my four kids or or my job. Um, but God doesn't first go to bear each other's burdens, but make sure you stay well balanced on a healthy diet and da 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 da. And obviously, you you and I know that that's an important thing. But we just let God's word speak. Maybe it cuts us to the heart a little bit. Maybe mm-hmm. you know those kind of things. But it's good for us because this is it says the law of Christ, which I heard I, I saw a commentary just point us to John fifteen. This is my commandment that you love one another. And it's, it's so simple, but yet we know it's com- so complex. Um, uh, any any thoughts on that? that? That's a high calling. How are we to look at this? Well, uh, in essence, it's not us doing it, but the Holy Spirit living in us. But And uh, if you think about Jesus um, and how Jesus lived his life while he was here on earth, he cared for people, and he could... He had the ability to see in their hearts and know fully the struggles and the burdens that they were going through. And so he bore them all the way to the cross. At the same time, in his humanity, he often, often, often went out by himself to get some alone time and get some time of rest. And so um, to think that we can bear everybody else's burdens without getting rest for our souls Um, that's silly. And so that's why we have a Sabbath, but that's why we have God's Word every day. Um, But at the same time, realizing that it is not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit that we are able to do these things. Absolutely. Great, great way to always, and that's what Paul does. We've we've gone through 2 Corinthians, and we've now completing Galatians, and that's a common theme. This is not for when I'm strong, uh, or when I'm, excuse me, I'm going the wrong direction. When I am weak, I am strong because I have Christ. Now, let me use another analogy in this, uh, because I talked to my kids quite a bit about this, and I did not understand this when I was going through school is that when you do a project or you do a writing or something along those lines, is that you need help. You know, you have teachers, you have aides or whatever. You need help. And I and I have a few Ph.D. Um, members in my congregation. I asked them one time, when you did your thesis, how many people helped you? And they said, well, well, one guy said that he, you know, he had five people read over his thesis and they're like Ph.D. people who were reading through it. Editors, if you write a book, you at least have five or six people look at it to give comments Mm -hmm. on it and all this. And then here I am writing a two page paper for fifth grade or something like that, thinking I don't need help. I mean, that's quite arrogant that the PhD guy needs five people and I don't need anybody. That makes no (laughs) sense. And that relates to us and God that we, if we think that all of this, I'm going to bear one of those burdens on my own. What is going on? I mean, Jesus says, Mm -hmm. I am the vine. You are the branches fruit of the Spirit flows from that vine onto us. And all these things he tells us today, remember, this is Christ working through you. Don't get so arrogant to think that you can do it. Remember, it is Jesus who is on your side and the Holy Spirit that he pours upon you. Any last thoughts on this? Like you said, it's beautifully said, high calling, but it is Christ who is on our side. 
Yeah, I, uh, I've, I told my kids when they were younger that the difference between the A and B plus students and the C students are the A and B plus students asked for help. Yeah. They went yeah. to the teacher and said, I don't understand this. Please help me. And I learned <laughs> that the same as you from from a uh, horrible experience when I was too proud or too afraid to ask for help. And so I did. And, and I suffered for it. And I'm still paying the student loans for it, too. <laughs> but um, I, I'm done paying student loans. I've been going to. But anyways, um, <laughs> when it comes to, uh, you know, this and bearing each other's burdens and going and showing folks their uh, sins and trying to get people out of their their nets, the first thing we need to do is uh, just pray a very simple prayer that I pray quite often and it's just holy spirit help yeah and the holy spirit doesn't just help but he gives you the words to say he gives you the the mind and the attitude and the the peace with which to say it and so i found that when i don't do that then things are a a whole lot more difficult and a whole lot more muddled and that's where um, Jesus reminds us in Luke chapter 11, whenever you pray for the Holy Spirit, our Lord will give it. And and the call of the Christian is like the lepers in Luke 17, um, um, Lord, have mercy on us. We have about a minute left here, Pastor. I'm going to read verses 3 through 5, and we'll, we'll touch on it. We'll dig into it after the break. So Paul says, 3 through 5, For anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each, other, let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. We'll be touching on this on the other side of our break. We are studying Galatians chapter 6 with Pastor Jeremy Klostermeyer. We'll be right back. This is Dr. Dale Meyer. Have you heard Concordia Seminary's program, Word and Work and Intersection? Every week you can hear it on KFUO Thursdays at 2 p.m. Central Time. We visit with many interesting guests about how the Word of God applies to their daily vocations and ministries. Be sure to tune in and may the intersection of Word and Work be busy on your corner. This week on Issues Etc., we'll discuss Christian nationalism with Dr. Albert Moeller. We'll talk with Pastor Brian Wolfmiller about what I wish my non-Lutheran family members knew about Holy Communion. And we'll visit with Dr. Carl Truman, author of the new book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. Issues Etc., live weekday afternoons from 3 to 5 on KFUO. I'm Pastor Phil Robbins. I'm senior pastor here at Crown of Life Lutheran Church in Sun City West, Arizona. We are in beautiful Arizona, and we ask you to come and find us when you're wintering down here. Visit our website at colchurch.com, colchurch.com. God's blessings in your travels. And welcome back. We're studying Galatians chapter 6 with Pastor Jeremy Klostermeyer, and we are speaking about bearing one another's burdens and to fulfill the law of Christ. And now we've gotten to verses 3 through 5, um, and he points us once again to repentance and humility. He doesn't use those words, but he says this, For anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. We hear this in other parts of the of of the scriptures um, when he says uh, Romans chapter chapter twelve. I say to everyone among you to not think of himself more highly than he ought uh, to think. 
And this is important for us, especially when we're bearing each other's burdens, when we're looking to one another of gentleness. Um, and, 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 and Pastor Klostermeyer, why is it so important to not think more highly of yourself than you ought? Well, because you are uh, trying to have the mind of Christ, who, uh, though he was very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing. Mm. And so you got that word nothing right there. If you think you're something when you're nothing, you're lying to yourself, you're deceiving yourself. And so um, going to somebody and helping them to get out of the entanglement of sin It's not going to work if you are uh, going in a spirit of judgment or if you are going thinking that you are better than the person you are going to. Um, It it just doesn't work. And that's when you get into the uh, idea where you hear a lot of uh, people in the world and even people in the church, you know, thinking of you as a a jerk or a hypocrite or a holier-than-thou kind of a person. So you... Uh, you always got to check your attitude uh, and uh, continually humble yourself. Well, and yeah, it reminds me of, you know, whenever you enter a room is to check yourself at the door. I think that's a, a little bit of worldly wisdom that really relates to this is check yourself at the door, which is a reminder, take that deep breath, remind yourself who you are, which is a redeemed sinner, you know, not emphasis on sinner, but that we have our own brokenness and we come. And what's between us? I went to a pastor's office once, and uh, he had just this cross in the in the middle of the table that people would sit at. And I think that was just a wonderful vision of um, that when you meet with whomever you meet, what joins us and what comes between us is not um, anything other than Christ Himself. And so, like you said, you want the mind of Christ. Um, and it, it's interesting too. At the end, uh, for each will have to bear his own load, and. I, I kind of struggled with this, these parts, you know, um, verse four and five. Yes, test your own work. You know, this is a repentance language. Check yourself at the door. Um, but verse five, I, I saw one commentary kind of talk about, you know, if you want to go that direction of doing this all on yourself, it's going to be a big um, load to bear, which I thought was a good way to speak on that. But any, any thoughts on those last two verses and, and what, what Paul's telling us? Well, I, I... Uh, it's a good kind of segue into Ash Wednesday, that uh, mm-hmm. if we are testing our own work, then his reason to boast will be in himself. Well, you'll never have actual reason to boast in yourself. So it's it's almost, uh, I take it, uh, and what I've read about it, it's almost in a sarcastic kind of tone um, <laughs> that you're going to, you, go ahead, go ahead and test your own work, and if you can find reason to boast in yourself, then that's fine, but you're not going to. So if you're going to go that way, you're going to have to bear your own load. But, uh, but realize that uh, that's not how, how Christ would have us do it. That's right. not how and it works. And it's a, a load way too big for you to bear. That's why, you know, <laughs> it always goes back to the cross. You know, the, 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 the bearing that he had of the cross was even for him, you know, too much in his humanity. And so he had a helper. But yet when he died, all the sins of the world were on himself. So don't take that load on yourself. It was put on Jesus himself as well. Let's move on to verses 6 through 8. We have, I mean, 6 through 10 here is just outstanding stuff, so I'm excited. Let's go 6 through 8 and break it down before we get to 9 and 10. One who is taught the word must share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit and spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. Um, I'll just give a little bit of segue here to verse six, where it just says, you know, share good things with the one who teaches. And that's just, to me, just a, a simple exhortation. Um, pray for your pastors, support your pastors or your uh, teachers or other youth workers or whatever it might be. Um, those who bring the word of God, um, respect them. This is a commandment, a uh, fourth commandment type of thing. And, and uh, do you have anything else to say on that? I think it's pretty simple, but is there more you wanted to say? Yeah, well, I think there's a a sense of appreciation for not so much for the teacher as for what 
he's teaching and that you're, mm. um, mm-hmm. you know, in verse seven, you know, uh, God is not mocked, um, in the commentaries that I've been reading, it's more of a, a sense of turning one's nose up at, uh, God. And if you're not appreciative of what you've been taught, you're kind of going to mock it. You're going to, you're going to turn your nose up at it. You're going to turn away from it. But if, uh, if you are appreciative of it, then you're going to share good, all good things with the one who's teaching you, so that uh, so that he can keep on teaching, so that he doesn't have to get another job, making tents <laughs> or becoming a full-time sports fisherman. There you go. Yeah, what a burden that would be on many people. I'm guarantee it. <laughs> no. But that's a that's a good point, and I think it it you know the the understanding of not mocking God. And we might think, well, that you know, that's that person who confirmed their faith in eighth grade and never came back to church. Well, we we can mock God all the time and say, well, I, you know, yeah, you said this, but you didn't really mean it, or you know, this part I really like that part. Therefore, I'm going to focus on it and something else. And so he's not only <laughs> he's not just talking about uh, those people over there, like you said so well at the beginning, but he's speaking about us. Don't yeah. mock God because that's a huge load to bear. Last thoughts on those on those first two verses? Well, and it gets back to the verses before that we have to treat our own sin with the seriousness it deserves and not just uh, gloss over it, look over it, or, you know, to say, oh, I'm not worried about getting caught up in that person's sin. I'm pretty strong in myself. And, uh-huh. and uh, you know, I got to, we always, always, always have to, um, you know, what Jesus said, take the log out of our own eyes so then we can see clearly to take the speck out of our brother's eyes. So we need to uh, take our sin seriously and uh, always, always, always be looking at ourselves and our own, what we are sowing so that we uh, are not sowing to the flesh, but sowing to the Spirit. And I'm going to take one step back because like you said so well there is a reminder to you, our listeners, and to all Christians, is that everything takes time when you're caring for souls. You know, I know you, you and I have had conversations about the care of souls and, 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 and just, I think we have this understanding that we can kind of clean everything up relatively quickly in, in simple ways. And then we don't really think about the complexities that even our own parents had to go through with each one of us individually, <laughs> that our, our spouse has to go through for, uh, with us individually, our elders in our churches or whoever might be. And we make it sound like things can be fixed quickly when the reality is it, it just takes time. It takes relationships. Mm-hmm. It takes prayer. It takes the Holy Spirit, um, which brings us into these next few verses is that um, when w- the, the best thing, and uh, we talked about this in Galatians, is that every time we, you are, um, God brings someone into your life, it's good for us to be reminded that this is a person that Christ has died for. And then therefore, we can ask for the peace and patience and kindness and joy and everything else. Um, just take your time because this is God's redeemed child. So let's move on to eight and nine um, because we could talk about that all day as well. But here yeah. he, he talks about spirit and flesh and reaping. Um, what is he talking about with spirit versus the flesh? How would you how would you talk about that? Well, um, you can go back to the uh, the last chapter where uh, mm-hmm. in verse sixteen he says five. Chapter five, sixteen. I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So in here, he's talking about uh, sowing and reaping by the Spirit versus sowing and reaping by the flesh. And so we have the the two natures going on here. We have our spirit nature, which uh, we've been sanctified uh, by the Holy Spirit, who's washed us in the in the waters of holy baptism, who continues to make us holy day by day as He convicts us of our sin and and uh, continues to pour his forgiveness into us. So that's sowing by the Spirit. But then we have the fleshly uh, temptations and falling into those temptations and the, and the sinful nature that we have the flesh. And so if we are spending our time 
sowing seeds in the fleshly nature, that's when we reap corruption. And so you can, in a very simple way, think about how you're spending your time. Are you spending your time in God's Word? Are you spending your time in prayer, in repentance, in in getting as much of the Word and the sacraments into you as you can? Or are you uh, spending time on uh, TikTok and and surfing the Facebook and and looking at things that you shouldn't be looking at and listening to things you shouldn't be listening to. So this is a very uh, kind of practical thing. Uh, but again, it comes down to uh, continually, uh, continual repentance, daily drowning of the old Adam, that the new man can come forth. So um, uh, being a a uh, farm kid, I think of when I think of sowing and reaping, I think of uh, what what uh, gets put in the field and how you uh, fertilize and water that seed. And, and if you're going to put it, put crummy seed into the field, that's what you're going to get. That's the that's the fruit that you're going to to yield, and it's not going to be too great. Um, and so, um, at the same time, you know. If you're sowing by the Spirit or sowing to the Spirit, it's going to be Holy Spirit stuff. And how does the Holy Spirit work? He works through the means of grace. And that's really good because we do live in a, uh, uh, like a lot of people will say, I have a grandpa and my grandmother were farmers um, or great grandparents. But, you know, less and less people are going to say, I grew up on a farm. You know, and so it's good for us to think about. It's simply this: sowing is what you put in the ground. Is that kind of how you said it? You, sowing mm-hmm. is what you put in there. And the question is: Are you putting good seed into there? Are you putting good fertilizer into there? That's gonna. And then reaping is what grows. I mean, I I, I don't want to. I'm not mocking you because I part of it is because I don't get into it much, and I have grandparents that were um, farmers, but it's just good, simplistic stuff. So sowing is what you put in, reaping is what grows, right? Make it simple? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. and All right. You think of yourself as the soil, <laughs> and uh, whatever you put into yourself, that's uh, what's going to come out, you know? And so uh, what does Jesus say? It's not what goes into a man that makes him simple, but what comes out. So that what you sow, that is what you will also reap so don't put don't put junk in junk in junk out <laughs> that's <simple> good. stuff <laughs> <laughs> i've been crucified with christ and all i live who christ who lives in me so receive the good things of christ do and from there good things will bear fruit from it which points us to verses 9 and 10 which i i love these verses because they were uh, we did a certain event a couple years in st louis and the group that we worked with this was their theme verses which was very powerful to use with our kids and let's be honest very powerful to use for us as adults as well mm-hmm. verses 9 and 10 let us not grow weary of doing good for in due season we will reap if we do not give up so then as we have opportunity let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Verse 9, he says, uh, let us not grow weary. How do, I mean, doing good. How can that happen, right? We always want to do good. <laughs> How can we grow weary? Tell us about growing weary. Well, um, being a parent and having uh, two kids who are, my daughter is going to be 20 here in a couple of weeks, but uh, a parent grows tired of dealing with their kids. That doesn't mean that we stop dealing with their kids or that we stop loving them, but you get tired of it. But we know that if we love our kids and keep loving them, that uh, we will have done our duty. And, and hopefully, if we are loving them with the love of Christ, they will remain in Christ. Uh, so mm-hmm. I can think of it that way, or um, you know, the uh, there's nothing uh, bad that can come out of doing good. Um, you might not get the the um, fruit that you expect, and you might not get the praise or the honor and the glory that you want, but. Uh, God will 
make good happen from what you have done. It might be uh, a long time down the road. We talked a lot about patience today. Uh, and so in the due season, we will reap if we do not give up. And so uh, good is going to come out of doing good. Um, but you can't, if you don't see automatic results, and pastors have to take a special knowledge of this, special understanding that if you don't see, uh, you know, you talked about confirmation class earlier, um, mm-hmm. You know, it might be that that kid who went through eighth grade confirmation doesn't show up for 10 years afterwards, but you have still planted the seeds of God's word and of his His knowledge and catechesis and those kinds of things in that person. And so, uh, or you can go to the Proverbs passage and say, you know, um, train a child in the way he should go when he's old, he will not depart from it. You know, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. so it's all about uh, simply doing what God has given you to do. Um, and he says, it. you know, it, it, I was thinking about when you talk about the youth, because, you know, Isaiah 40 says, even youth grow tired and weary. <laughs> and so <laughs> we can talk about how we get tired, but even youth do, which means he says, do not grow weary, meaning, you know, kind of a, a chin up. Uh, because there will there will be fruit that will be bore. Um, yeah. This goes to Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. Fruit of the mm-hmm. Spirit flows from Jesus upon us. Um, and if we do not give up, this is a reminder to our listeners, do not give up. Um, you might have children who do not go to church. You might have loved ones and neighbors that just, for whatever reason, are just apathetic about the faith. But it's amazing to me, um, the more I do this, is that God will provide. And we pray by the Holy Spirit that these things will happen. So he says, do good. Um, um, so bring in the good stuff, and there will be a reap of all of this. In verse 10, I love how he says this. So then, as we have opportunity let us do good to everyone. And I think those words, as we have opportunity, are important. Any thoughts on those words? Yeah, it's, uh, well, first of all, it's not something that we have to force because there's always opportunities to do good. So whenever we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. So not just to those who are of the household of faith, but especially to those of our own household, the church, so to speak. But, uh, you know, when I think of this, this is what I think of when it comes to um, mission work, that we, whenever we have opportunity, look for the opportunities in your life and do good and just love mm-hmm. people where they're at. Because you can only do so much, you know. That's one thing yeah. I think is a theme here is that we'll need help, uh, and it begins with I think uh, um, you know Professor uh, Dr. Bierman would talk about this. Where should you start at St. Louis Seminary? Uh, start at, at at home, okay? Who can I serve at home? And you think about mm-hmm. that as you mentioned. That's going to grow, make us grow tired and weary. And then simplistically, y- you point who else do I see people? Oh, people in my church. How can I do good? to them. And mm-hmm. like you said, he says especially he says especially to those of the household of faith. He doesn't say only those of the household of faith. But God, think of it this way, God has called you to the church, not only us as pastors to the church, but also the, you're, you're there and God's called you there. And the people who are with you, those who you commune with, those who you pray with, those who you sing with, how can we help one another in that place. And from there, it'll bubble over into our daily vocations as well. I, I, I love this verse because it, it reminds us of our limitations. Don't try to save the world. Jesus already did that. Secondly, it gives us some practical applications of who we can serve in our lives. Last thoughts before we move on. I mean, we're going to be low on time, but last thoughts because I want you to run ahead on those. Yeah, um, no, I think there's a lot of people out in the world who are depressed and anxious and uh, even of the household of faith. And one way that I've found uh, to get rid of that is to start thinking about other people. Like if I spend too much time in my office, I start getting kind of down about things. And so best way to deal with that is to call somebody on the phone or go visit somebody in their home or 
uh, make a pot of soup for somebody and bring it to them and and just do things for other people. And if there's one way to get out of the doldrums, especially in this COVID time, it's to to care for others. And uh, that will uh, that fulfills not only fulfills the law of Christ, but also gives you joy. Absolutely. So to serve others as our Lord has served us. We're going to be uh, we're running low on time here. We have about seven minutes left. So I'm going to read verses um, eleven through. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to go 11 through 16 and and speak about about that. So much good stuff here. So here we go. See what large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. Never mind, I'm going to stop there. Um, <laughs> so he begins, see what large letters I am writing to you. Wouldn't you love to see the original manuscript? Do you think he like just made huge letters right there? What do you think? <laughs> Instead of using an exclamation point or a bunch of, uh, um, <laughs> or just uh, you know putting everything in all caps, that's kind of what we would do today, put it all in all caps. He wants to... Right. Uh, he wants to make sure that you get it, make sure that you get his attitude, because you can't really put attitude in on paper as much as you... He, he wants to yell it at them, basically, is and, what he's saying. And he's, and he's doing it, and he's doing it, all in caps. And he speaks here, <laughs> and he's really going after the Judaizers. Once again, the Judaizers are the ones who want... You have to get circumcised, almost like, okay, there's Jesus right over there, but you got to go through circumcision to get to him. And he's calling them out that if they're saying you have to be circumcised this is all not done in humility it's done for their own personal gain other thoughts on the judaizers and what they're trying to do here well they're trying to earn their own salvation or to Mm -hmm. these judaizers are trying to proselytize their false teaching of needing to be circumcised in order to be saved so that they can uh uh boast on themselves and say, look at all these people that we got to do this. And, uh, you know, they're trying to, trying to, um, uh, make, as it says here, make a good showing, uh, Mm. in the flesh. Um, you know, they're trying to, they're trying to look good basically is the best way to put it. And, uh, you know, when you're trying to look good, that's usually when you look like a jerk and that's kind of what he's trying to, get them to understand these guys are not trying to help you they're just trying to make themselves look good and that's such a temptation like he he says that and he's pointing at the judaizers but boy i feel like he's pointing at me because there's Mm -hmm. a lot of times when we see success and this is in your own family or so it goes both ways so we see success we want to take the gain and when we see uh, uh, something go wrong then we want to take all the blame both of which points on ourselves as opposed to pointing to the Lord. And it's so easy to try to boast and say, look at that success. That was all me, all those things. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that, on that temptation? Well, it's one of the biggest ones for us pastors is to, (laughs) you know, when church is going good and everybody's showing up and uh, church attendance is awesome, then we're, we're a big man on campus. But as soon as we get something like COVID and nobody's showing up, then, then uh, then we go to Facebook and we see how many views we got and oh, to yeah. pump ourselves up a little bit. And I don't know what those views really even mean anyways, but, you know, to, <laughs> to have followers and views and those kinds of things, um, that's, we do it all for uh, the glory of God. And as soon as we start to take glory for ourselves, that's where trouble comes and, and that's where all all manner of people fall into all manner of sin, and eventually sin gets found out. Absolutely. And that's that's a good reminder for all of us. Lord, have mercy as we replace one God with another. Let's continue on, verse 14. He tells us, don't boast in the flesh or other people's flesh, boast in something else. I'm going to read uh, all through the end here. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. 
And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear my, on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. So what are we supposed to boast in here, Pastor? Just in Jesus. That's why we put big old crosses up on our, on our uh, steeples. That's why we put big old crosses on the front of our churches, wear them around our necks. And to remind us of the cross of Christ and to boast in that and in that alone. So, um, you know, uh, it's something that we have to be continuously reminded of that, you know, I talked about our building program here at St. John's. And if we're doing that for ourselves, it's going to be a waste of time and a waste of money and a lot of waste of effort. But if we're going to use that building to put forward the cross and to bring people to Jesus and to fulfill the Great Commission uh, and to love others so that they might feel the love of Christ, then we're doing what God has called us to do. And so um, we got nothing to boast in. We're poor, miserable sinners, and we need the cross. We need Jesus for ourselves. And so that's that should always be before us, in front of us, behind us, on the side of us, and everywhere we go. It's uh, nothing else counts. Circumcision doesn't count. Not being circumcised doesn't count. Church membership doesn't count. All that counts is Jesus for you and in you. As you said so well, you are a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. Um, The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. These are wonderful words, and he ends it so well in verse 18. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers, and amen. Pastor Jeremy Klostermeyer of St. John Lutheran Church in Warrington, Missouri, helping us today with Galatians chapter 6. Pastor Klostermeyer, thank you for being our guest. You guys have a wonderful day. Saints of our Lord, in Christ you are new creation. Keep watch of yourselves and stay in that grace. Bear one another's burdens and boast in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for joining us, and the Lord keep you safe in the palm of his hands.